Good day, everybody. Uh, welcome to week five uh, of uh, the Ubuntu Symposium. We're glad everybody, um, you know, people have a chance to come back um, to join us this week. And uh, before we start with the panel today, we wanted to go through some of our, you know, uh, technical and um, sound interpretation issues, just so you all know. <clears throat> What to what to expect? Um, if you know you're going to see that we have um, well, that's the, our session of today. In terms of the interpretation, we have uh, simultaneous interpretation into um, English, Spanish, and uh, French. Um, so if you please could uh, select on the bottom of your screen. There's a little globe like the one shown here in the slide that you just click on that and choose your, your language. And even if you don't need, because you understand all three languages, select one because otherwise you'll be, when you speak, if you speak, um, you can uh, interfere with the, all the other channels. So if everybody can choose a language, uh, that would be fabulous. Uh, we also have for other languages uh, that are not contemplated in the, in the interpretation today, we have Wordly. It's, um, it's a live streaming service that allows you to get on screen um, some sort of, tra of uh, translation, maybe not perfect in terms of uh, jargon and other you know, terminology that we might use, but it will uh, facilitate for those who need translation into another, um, another language that's not English, uh, Spanish, or French. Um, so that's how you do, and you can choose, and then you will have you know, the, the screen in one side and the, the um, translation on the other side of your, of your screen. I mean, you have the panelist and the, and the translation. Also, if you are, um, you know, into social media and you want to uh, let people know what's going on into you know, in this conversation, you have the hashtag of our Ubuntu Symposium. And um, please, you know, let the world know if you're enjoying it and what uh, something new is going on. So, um, as I had said about our panel today will we'll, um, we'll be joined by five exceptional experts you know, for this conversation today, experts in sexual and reproductive health and rights you know, from different uh, perspectives and from different parts of the globe. Um, and uh, we will have an exciting conversation about power, bodily integrity, and uh, SRHR. Um, touching on issues that usually we don't see in the same conversation, uh, such as you know, the universal human right to bodily integrity um, and issues of power or control or the lack thereof um, uh, in terms of lack of conditions to keep ourselves you know, healthy and to protect our uh, well-being. So we'll, you know, we'll be chatting with these amazing uh, people about um, what we need uh, to know and what we so we can uh, address these issues uh, better. To guide us, you know, to take us through this conversation, we will have a, an amazing moderator, uh, Rose um, Ektesadis. Um, I hope that uh, I'm pronouncing it right, <laughs> your, your name, Rose. Um, who's um, a public health uh, specialist in, with extensive experience in uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, in the gender rights, um, gender-based violence, HIV. And uh, she's got you know, 20 years plus of experience and uh, currently serving as the executive director of SAFAIDS. Uh, she's a native of Zimbabwe has lived you know, in, in South Africa for a long time and uh, has experience across Africa. Um, and she will serve today as our moderator um, and we'll introduce our panelists 
and um, you know engage in this, this conversation with all of us. With that, uh, over to you, Rosette. Thank you so much, Magali, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or hello, friends. Uh, thank you so much to the Men Engage Alliance uh, for not just hosting this symposium in the most difficult condition and pulling together the globe around imperative issues, but bringing out positive dis disruption around topics such as power and bodily integrity. So we're we're generally used to hearing sexual reproductive health rights, but the issues of power and bodily integrity have remained mainly in the periphery and often left out of the gender justice and sexual reproductive panorama. So fantastic that uh, this intersect is going to be interrogated today. It's a vast topic, um, but hopefully it will stimulate and motivate a deeper interrogation of the intersect especially in the advent of COVID-19, where we do, we have seen how issues of power have started to come to the surface and be redefined. And it is time for us to, to move away from the more moralized context of sexual reproductive health rights um, and tackle the underlying matters of power, the matters of uh, bodily integrity. It is a human right. Not many people know that it is actually a human right um, and fundamentally so. Um, and hopefully we will hear uh, more also from um, our esteemed panelists on issues around uh, diversity and how does that fit into the complexity uh, of power and bodily in integrity. So we do have, as Magali said, four incredible personalities with us today and I will introduce them. And as I do introduce them, I'd like to ask them to, to take about a minute and a half to two minutes to say hello to our uh, to delegates who've joined us. Um, and also just, you know, as a, as a startup trigger, say to us what they feel is the most concerning violation of bodily integrity in this moment in time, um, in the space of humanity. So we welcome Deborah Diniz. Uh, Deborah, as many of us will know, is a renowned leader in the field of reproductive justice and gender equality. She is the deputy director of rights and justice at the international IPPF WHR. She co-founded and served as ED of ANIS. And ANIS is a um, very unique um, uh, body. And it's an institute on bioethics uh, and it's a feminist organization that focuses on bioethics and human rights. She serves as a professor of, she served as a professor of law at the University of Brasilia and, and Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil, a visiting fellow at Yale Law School and New York University uh, Law School visiting scholar um, at Brown University. She has extensive research around abortion and interestingly enough, the Zika virus. Um, and she has experience with the Brazilian Supreme Court specifically around uh, cases related to abortion, marriage equality and the secular state. A dynamic uh, uh, exemplary woman who uh, by standing up for social justice, uh, was forced into exile uh, due to death threats against herself and those close and, and loved by her. As a human rights defender, we're still very proud and uh, honored that the powers that may be who have tried to thwart her social justice stance have not, um, have not come to fruition and she's with us today. Uh, Denise, uh, Deborah, you're welcome to say hello. Muchas gracias y un día bonito para todas las personas que están acá. Te agradezco muchísimo, José, por las palabras. Son, es mucho escuchar mucho, Débora, 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 es mucho para mí, pero pero es un, un placer muy grande estar acá con ustedes. Y la, pre, la pregunta me provoca desde, desde, 
de la posición de estar en la región del mundo más impactada por COVID. Y en un periodo de cinco años, son dos emergencias sanitarias que tocaron nuestra región y las mujeres y las niñas han sido olvidadas al centro de las respuestas sanitarias. Estamos hablando de Zika y de COVID en un intervalo de cinco años. Y así mi respuesta para vos es que tenemos que sacar una lección de, de este silencio, una lección de qué está pasando acá, que no aprendemos con Zika, no aprendemos con COVID, que son las mujeres y las niñas y las poblaciones de género diverso las que están en el centro del huracán de cuál es el impacto de las medidas sanitarias. Yo, yo tengo un minuto y creo que utilicé un minuto. Muchas gracias por la invitación y estar acá con ustedes. Gracias, gracias, obrigada. Thank you so much. And indeed, definitely, we cannot allow our women and girls to be the center of the hurricane of COVID-19. We have unfortunately left them the center of HIV and several other adversities around SRH, but we have an opportunity to not let that be repeated uh, amidst this pandemic. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome Leila Sh Sharafi. She is a senior gender advisor at the United Nations UNFPA in New York City, manages global initiatives, including women and girls empowerment, engagement of men and boys for gender equality, and promotes the rights of adolescents and young people. Very, very imperative, especially in this pandemic alongside women and girls. Young people and adolescents have been left behind. So, I really look forward to some insights from Leila in this regard with, uh, with the context of power, um, bodily integrity and SRHR. So prior to joining UNFPA, she does have a wide portfolio. Um, she has uh, engaged with different regions around the world and she's worked on women's economic empowerment as well with the United Nations Development Fund for Women. She holds a master's degree in international affairs from the New School for um, Social Research. So very big welcome to Leila. Um, your one and a half to two minutes of hello. Well, thanks so much, Uze, for the introduction and thanks to Men Engage for having me. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here today um, talking about this very important topic Um, and I want to say that while there are many, many violations that we could certainly speak of, one in particular that I would like to highlight is the harmful practice. Um, the harmful practice, as we know, is the act that harms and violates a girl's body and is only the start of a cascade of harms. Every day, thousands, hundreds of thousands of girls around the world we know are subjected to physical or psychological or both. Uh, harm without their full consent, of course, and um, oftentimes um, in their best interest by their families, friends, and communities. This year alone, four and a half million girls, sorry, 4.1 million girls were at risk of female genital mutilation. FGM is, uh, of course, recognized internationally as a violation of human rights, particularly as it relates to bodily integrity and the practice you know, not only violates the person's right to health, but also physical integrity. Um, and in the case where the procedure leads to death, of course, right to, right to life. Um, another harmful practice that at UNFPA we are often talking about is the violation of bodily integrity as it relates to child marriage. And uh, we know that it's universally banned, but yet 33,000 times a day, every day around the world, on average, uh, cutting across countries, cultures, religions, and ethnicities, we see this practice happening. We understand it's closely linked to poverty and the context is very important, but the unfortunate truth is that it doesn't just limit a girl's education, right? It, earn, it, it, it affects her potentially for the future in, in the long term and it limits her from making autonomous choices about her own body. Uh, but that said, I do want to say on a positive note, we see 
changes and tides of change coming. Uh, one example of change, particularly as it relates to FGM, if I may mention, is that more women, girls, men, and boys are learning about the practice and its harm. And we can see that opposition to the practice is growing. So in the last two decades alone, the proportion of girls and women in, let's say, high prevalence countries who want to stop the practice has doubled. So I do think there is hope in terms of bodily integrity, in terms of power, in terms of privilege and SRHR, but we have to be vigilant and really sustain the momentum that we've worked really hard to gain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. And I think, you know, much of what you said speaks very close to me because I'm from the African continent and a lot of the issues around these specific harmful practices are what we've you know lived with and grown up with and you're absolutely right as much as we have to bring to the fore uh, the negativity um, and and the adversity that harmful practice has been cascading from the moment uh, the baby is born and actually recognizes being female through to alas you know um, the end of life uh, is that there has been a rising as you've said of traditional religious and to a degree political leaders who have said no, no enough is enough we can't put our girls um, and young women through these harmful practices we want them to be part of our society and to fulfill the trajectory as as uh, citizens that contribute to our development and so i i hope that as much as we will raise the adversities around bodily integrity and its relationship to power and srhr and gender justice we will also speak about um what has worked because we do want as you said to build on that maintain vigilance and momentum, and that is needed so much more now, and it's COVID-19, because the cracks of social protection have gone wider for our women and girls, um, and especially our girl child. So thank you so much. I look forward to more from Leila. And so at this point, I'd like to welcome Dr. Marcos uh, Nascimento. He's a Brazilian psychologist. He holds a doctorate degree in collective health from the Institute of Social Medicine at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. He's a public health researcher, um, very uh, extensive, I understand, his work of research and empirical data generation. Um, and uh, he, he is with the Fernandez Figuera National Institute for the Health of Women, Children, and Adolescents at Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. <clears throat> he has also been co-executive director and um, of Promundo, and I do understand he's got a very long history with Men Engage Alliance, so quite a close ally to, um, to the agenda of, of elevating men and boys as proponents of gender equality. And um, he's on the board of directors of Instituto Nunes, and he has authored a wide range of publications on masculinity, sexuality, um, and informs policy advocacy and program design. So welcome, Marcos. Uh, Thank you. Uh, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Es un gusto, un honor, un placer estar con ustedes en el día de hoy. Uh, tengo una larga historia con, con Men Engage Alliance uh, desde el inicio y es un, un honor estar en el tercero simposio global, ¿no? El primero en Río, después en Delhi y ahora por el globo de una manera remota. Eh, hace muchos años que, que trabajo con el tema de, de violencia basada en género y creo que la violencia basada en género es como una pandemia de alguna manera silenciosa, ¿no? eh, que es un fenómeno global, está en todos los países, en todas las regiones y creo que una de las cosas, como Débora ha mencionado, ¿no? durante esos cinco años que enfrentamos ¿no? la pandemia de Zika en Latinoamérica, después ahora la pandemia de COVID-19, el tema de la violencia basada en género sigue siendo un tema muy fuerte. ¿no? Y, y cuando hablo de la, de la violencia basada en género, mi preocupación es que no es solamente eh, violencias interpersonales, domésticas o familiares, pero también la violencia ejercida por el Estado, ejercida por las instituciones, que tiene ahí eh, un impacto fuertísimo en la vida de mujeres y niñas, 
e como necessitamos estar atentos, atentas uh, a esse fenômeno que é parte da vida cotidiana de muita gente uh, ao redor do mundo. Né? Então, com isso, creio que o eh, rol de los homens e niños também na resposta à violência basada em gênero é algo extremamente relevante, importante, que necessitamos reflexionar e, e seguir pensando alternativas, formas de inclusão e também de, de organizar respostas mais efetivas. Né? Muito obrigado. Gracias, obrigado. Thank you so much, Marcos. Um, I think you're one of the examples that it is really possible to work uh, effectively with men and have a sustained engagement with them. You are you're you're one of the many role models uh, that brings us to this platform, and indeed, it's very very critical. Around gender base, it is not just it's about interpartner violence, domestic violence, what's in the house between, you know, in romantic relationships. But there is a, a critical and very silent, <laughs> often very silent systemic violence that runs through sometimes state bodies and, um, uh, you know, political spheres as well. Uh, and, and power comes in there because that is why there is silence. And that is why a lot of this data does not come to the fore, is not reported, but it is actually happening and leaving myriads of um, young women and girls, but also men, um, violated and affected for the rest of their lives. And we've seen this actually, the systemic violence go into other spaces beyond the state and, you know, that, that brought out, for example, the Me Too campaign, you know, into the development sector, into massive you know, global organizations and including civil society and development partner organizations. So it's very systemic. And as you've rightly pointed out, we have an opportunity at this juncture in humanity's time with COVID-19, where we're redefining the entire paradigm of how human and social development should look like uh, to have new ways and effective ways of engaging men to thwart um, this very systemic um, culture of violence that has almost been condoned. Um, and once, you know, we eradicate within the, within the home, within relationships, it still remains very strong within, um, structures and, and systems. So we hope to hear more of that from, from you. And finally, um, Vinuj Manang, I welcome you. He is the Chief Executive Officer of IPAS Development Foundation in India. Uh, so he takes us yet to another continent. Um, it is a partner organization of IPAS. He oversees IDF's efforts to improve the environment for safe abortion and increase access to comprehensive contraceptive care in the country. Very, very important and critical area, um, especially for adolescent girls. And uh, he works to strengthen the capacity of health systems to provide high quality abortion and contraceptive care and improving the evidence base around the provision of safe abortion care. Again, a very controversial SRHR issue um, um, pushed down by, by, you know, a lack of recognition of bodily integrity and pushed down by power dynamics. So welcome, Minus. Minus? You're on mute. Uh, uh, yeah, I was on mute, thank you. Thank you, Rosia. And as you said, abortion, I work on abortion <laughs> and a very, very critical issue in this whole debate. And it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me in this panel. And I would like to really start with a disclaimer, uh, reading the uh, bios of all the fellow panelists and you. I was slightly intimidated being here and I slightly thought maybe I should say no to the invitation. But then I said, probably there is a reason for me being here to talk about what's happening in the field. So probably I would do that. Uh, I would give you an India perspective. Uh, I'll try and give you an India perspective. So, you know, as we were talking about bodily autonomy is a sum of all the things that the right of every human being, including children, for the autonomy and self-determination of their own body. 
any unconsented intrusion is a violation for sure. And it can range from the whole thing of right from an unwanted touch to enforcing marriage of a woman. And as it was mentioned earlier also, it's a power issue because there are subtle and insidious ways in which various violations which threaten the human bodily integrity, women's bodily integrity, just doesn't get surfaced. It's covered up because of power. And uh, you know, also systematically, like for example, uh, in, a, in many countries, and especially in a country like India, uh, we refuse to recognize the concept of marital rape. This is a power, purely a power patriarchal way of uh, subduing bodily integrity and human rights. And you know, the comment that Leila made on early marriages brings me to another issue, this big issue. When we are talking of uh, uh, bodily integrity and the, uh, within the human rights issue, there is a circularity and interlinkages. For example, the early marriage, well, uh, we have noticed where we work in rural uh, India, along with tribals, the early marriages are a kind of a social norm. But it's just not about early marriage, which automatically results in low levels of education, and therefore inability and lack of agencies to make right choices about their sexuality. And therefore, unless we invest in addressing this in a holistic manner, we would not be able to provide solutions. And therefore, the integration between men and women in the society become critical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minuj. Um, I, I really like that that last the, a holistic manner. Um, definitely, when we speak SRHR, we speak gender justice. There does need to be a holistic approach. Um, often we look at SRHR through the lens of health alone, and yet there are all these other dimensions that you've you've already touched on, um, the four of you, and will continue to touch on. Um, Interesting that you you mentioned being um, feeling intimidated by the profiles of, of your colleagues on here. That's uh, that's actually um, that's a power issue in itself, and um, and it's it's very unfortunate that power has been aligned to position and to to having assets and money and um, academic, you know. Um, uh, accolades and so forth, and yet there is so much power in every single one of us that needs to be tapped and very little of it has been untapped. And I do hope that, you know, one of the four of you may, may actually speak to that, um, how as individuals we can tap into our power to be, to be confident enough to stand up for the rights of ourselves, but also the rights of others without um, fear. And um, issues of fear, of course, are very related to the topic um, in discussion here. Um, so that said, I think we're, we're going to go into a first round of, of, of um, conversation with our four esteemed uh, panelists and um, and you know I'd, we'd like to hear a little bit about your you know in context of your experiences and not just your experiences but what you view would be pragmatic in the now and going forward in this new dynamic of COVID-19 and the life that we are building and framing post COVID-19 what is going to be necessary to strengthen the gender justice agenda in a way that it will preserve sexual reproductive health. So perhaps Deborah, you could, uh, you could begin um, for about four minutes and share your perspectives around that, what your thoughts are in strengthening the gender justice agenda in a different way, a new way, a sustainable way that will protect sexual reproductive health rights and preserve the gains made, which COVID is threatening to reverse. 
Debra. Sí. Muchas gracias. Yo puse acá para estar segura que no voy a hablar sí. más que cuatro minutos. <risa> sí. uh, yo quería responder de manera muy pragmática y de, con tres puntos, porque ahí puedes, podemos abrir a la conversación. La primera es que no creo que podemos hablar de justicia de género y de integridad corporal sin tener en el centro de nuestra conversación no solo el concepto, pero el compromiso ético de la interseccionalidad. Interseccionalidad no es solo una descripción de nuestra diversidad, pero es un cambio en las dinámicas de poder. Por esto que te agradezco poner acá la conversación acerca de poder. ¿Y cómo cambiamos las dinámicas de poder? Primero, ¿cómo cambiamos la manera con que hablamos de suceso? de los cambios, de los cambios de incidencia, de, de cómo llegamos en las mujeres y las niñas, y si me permiten hablar de mujeres y niñas, como este componente de, de, de esta contribución en este panel. La, la segunda es cómo, en qué mujeres queremos llegar, en qué mujeres necesitan de que están desesperadas por un cambio en las estructuras desiguales de, de las dinámicas de género. Para esto necesitamos definir con interseccionalidad qué llamamos y cómo medimos vulnerabilidad de la vida, que está conectado con toda la precarización de las políticas con las normas, no, normas de género. El segundo que está conectado a esto, necesitamos llegar donde están. Y los modelos tradicionales de las organizaciones globales, como ha sido uh, donde estoy hoy, la Federación Internacional de Planificación Familiar, es que hablamos de países, hablamos de riquezas o las pobrezas de los países, y necesitamos hablar de verdad de desigualdades. Y las mujeres en situación de vulnerabilidad, las niñas en situación de vulnerabilidad, están en todos los países, y especialmente con toda la situación migratoria. Y en esta región del mundo, donde estamos con un movimiento, América Latina y Caribe, ¿no?, con un movimiento permanente de, de mujeres y niñas, de situaciones de conflicto, de, de, de problemas de, de, de emergencias sanitarias, es de verdad no dejar nadie para atrás. Y no dejar nadie para atrás demanda cómo vamos a operar con el poder de trabajar con y no de trabajar sobre las otras. Y el, en el último minuto, ¿Cómo vamos a mover las barreras que están con nosotras? La gente que trabaja con el marco de derechos para garantizar la justicia reproductiva, la justicia de género y garantizar la integridad corporal. Esto pasa que tenemos que operar con un modelo de ecosistemas. Hablamos del feminismo, de la comunidad de derechos sexuales y reproductivos, pero esto está conectado a la comunidad de... de de, de la tierra, del derecho a la tierra, de la, las comunidades indígenas, la discusión de medio ambiente, cómo operamos para romper los hilos y hacer una construcción verdadera de ecosistemas para así construir, construir puentes que puedan de verdad llegar en las mujeres en su diversidad. Exactamente, acabé con un segundo, miren. Soy muy performática como una brasileña, como ves, ¿no? Gracias. Fantastic. Well done. Thank you for that. Um, thank you so much, Deborah. I think um, we, we will summarize. You really, really raised some, some very important um, throw-ins there. And I'd like us to move on to um, uh, Vinu. Minuj, Minuj, actually, if we could uh, uh, hear your sentiments on what what you feel is is imperative to strengthening the current gender justice agenda and the response if we are to indeed um, tangibly safeguard sexual reproductive health rights. Welcome, Minuj. Thank you again. Um, You know, I think let us start with what do we all understand about gender justice and what are the components? Basically, if you're looking at gender justice, you're talking of an equal, full equality and equity between women and men in all spheres of life, 
that so much so that jointly women and on an equal basis with men uh, are defining and shaping policies, structures, decisions that affect their lives as individuals and as a society as a whole. Therefore, there is a very, very clear, distinct relationship between gender justice and uh, sexual and reproductive health rights. And it need not be really stated, one cannot exist without the other. But, you know, when we at an operational level, one of the problems that I have realized, and that's something that I have learned in the course of work that we are doing is uh, the framing of the discourse. And the language we use when working on SRH itself sometimes uh, uh, dilutes the whole goal of gender justice, though we are working for that. For example, uh, like, and I'm talking about this from a personal experience, when we are trying to work on um, SRH issues and gender justice, we are talking at a, and at operational level, uh, we find that a challenge. So what do we do? We look at, we frame the issue as, uh, because especially because you're talking to various power structures and so on and so forth, uh, we frame it as issues of health, maternal mortality and morbidity, our interventions, our intent, our goals. But that by itself, I feel, is diluting the goal of gender justice uh, and uh, equality that we are working for. And again, I would like to come back. The other point I would make on this is, it's about holistic interventions. Uh, we, you know, we are, there was this uh, uh, program that we are continuing to run over a long period of the thing, where we wanted to try and give girls, young girls, tribal girls, agency for, uh, adopting contraception or having an abortion, um, giving them enough agency, no, information and agency to exercise their bodily rights. So what we initially started was we started working on that issue. But then there were two kinds of holistic dimensions we had to change. One is for them, abortion in the needs, hierarchical needs of SRHR, abortion contraception, that was I, IDF, my organization, our team's need not really in their hierarchy of needs, it was much lower. So we had to reframe to meet their requirements, which was much more holistic. It started with right from meta, um, menstrual hygiene to a range of things. And now during COVID times, about COVID uh, protection, addressing fear, so on and so forth. But as we started empowering these women or with information and trying to build agency, we realized that we cannot do this without talking to their partners. Uh, and uh, uh, so we said we will extend our work and work with the partners, the men. But then we realized that if we really want to look at uh, interventions that work, build agency on a very sustainable basis and leave a social capital available there, we also need to look at key influencers in the community in the service provision setups and the pathways of care for SRH that they seek which pre or quite often are men. So without both these, uh, I don't think we will really build the linkage between gender justice and SRHR. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vinush. Thank you very much. Um, Leila, you're welcome to share your perspectives. How do we strengthen going forward gender justice agenda to protect sexual reproductive health rights. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for this really important question. And I think that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question, uh, which we could certainly debate for many days to come. But I think mm -hmm. to try to give this answer some kind of justice, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a few minutes. Uh, but I think in terms of preserving gains, protecting SRHR and, and also reproductive justice, we really need to build women and girls agency and decision making around SRHR. 
And interestingly enough, since we talk about protection, it's important to point out that many countries have strong laws to ensure SRHR, but the reality that women face is, is often very different. For example, to support member states in monitoring the implementation of SDG 5, in particular SDG target 5.6, which is focused on reproductive rights and uh, women and girls empowerment and, and rights in general, but vis-a-vis -vis SRHR, UNFPA helped measure women's reproductive decision-making in 57 countries and legislation on SRHR in 107 countries. But what we found was that only 55% of women globally say they make their own decisions on SRHR. Um, so that particular indicator is broken down into three subcomponents. And the component around the decision to use contraception, for example, was quite high, uh, but only three in four women said that they decide whether they make their own healthcare decisions or whether they can say no to sex. So what was brought up before about marital rape and the whole uh, issue of power vis-a-vis -vis sexual relations and, and how oftentimes women lack that ability to negotiate sex uh, with their partners is really something that um, has to be looked at and can, cannot be underestimated. And, and I think this reflects a deep lack of bodily autonomy and agency, which is linked to bodily integrity. So we know that on average, 73% of laws and regulations in place actually do guarantee full and equal access to SRHR, but women's reproductive rights are regressing in 40% of the countries that we studied. So um, what we also saw is that sexuality education curriculum is one area where we see uh, a very, very large set of challenges in terms of, you know, uh, comprehensive curriculum, implementation of curriculum, and et cetera, and, and lots of resistance. Secondly, I think to support bodily integrity uh, and, and uh, safeguard SRHR, Rose, which was your, was your question, um, is of course we need the full participation of the whole of society. Uh, and one way to do that, of course, is to work with men, as this is the Men Engaged Symposium. And in our experience as UNFPA, engaging men on um, SRHR actually gives us an excellent entry point to discuss and get to the gender power dynamics and relations. Um, just recently, we published a note about gender transformative approaches in relation to child marriage and FGM. Uh, and, and we saw that, you know, in, in terms of really doing the transformative work, there is potential. And we've been saying that since ICPD. But I think um, our experiences through our programs have really spoke louder than words. Uh, in, in Niger and throughout the West Africa region, we've been working with husbands to really try to transform norms around SRHR, foster better uh, dialogue between partners, and, and talk about issues that weren't often talked about in, in, in the public um, or even amongst men's, men themselves. Um, we're seeing great work happening in men, with men in, in fatherhood issues in Eastern Europe and Central Asia uh, with our great partnership with Men Engage. Uh, and, and I think with COVID, we've seen how the impact of um, the disproportionate care burden that women and girls are actually taking on is it provides us with an opportunity to try to ch challenge some of those power dynamics and, um, and norms around uh, who, who takes on what role and responsibility. Um, and throughout, uh, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's Ghana, Gambia, Ethiopia, we're working with, with boys as allies and champions to end, whether it's GBV or harmful practices. Um, and then finally, I do want to say a word about intersectionality uh, because, you know, as, as the other speakers, Jose, you pointed it out, Deborah as well, um, gender inequality intersects with other forms of discrimination, right? Systems of oppression uh, attract and come together. And so what we found over the course of these last 25 years since the ICPD program of action uh, anniversary, which 25 year anniversary was, was last year, and then the Beijing uh, platform for action anniversary of 25 years was this year, what those reviews have showed, showed us time and time again is that yes, progress has been slow, there has been progress, but who, whose bodies, right, are the ones that are facing the most violations? Who are the women and girls that are being most left behind? Well, it's the, it's the marginalized women and girls that are 
you know, either living in a context of poverty, are displaced, refugees, or indigenous, or um, with disabilities, <clears throat> and 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 um, or LGBTI. So I think that the more we recognize intersectionality as a critical part of a conversation when it comes to safeguarding SRHR, challenging power, it will be critical. Um, just in the United States alone, some studies show that women with disabilities are 40% more likely to experience abuse. Um, and in Panama and in Russia, indigenous women have been found to be approximately six times more likely to die in childbirth than the non-indigenous population. Um, and we have we've other data that shows, you know, um, what the reality is for unmarried girls and women with low education in rural areas um, in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of access to SRHR, and the, and the tons of barriers that they're facing, right, when, when it comes to their reproductive rights. Um, and then, of course, it's not even to mention all of the, the barriers that they may be facing with regards to language, communication, culture, et cetera. So um, in some, I think that, you know, one, it's to build agency of women and girls. Two, it's to work with the whole of society and that includes men and boys. And three, really to, to take intersectionality to heart, but not just accept it as a, con as a conceptual framework, but operationally, right? How do we do that? So um, I think that um, these are just some, just some thoughts from, from my side. Thanks so much, Ogre. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Marcos, would you like to put in your last stamp for this round? Sí, por supuesto. Uh, estaba pensando desde de los aportes de Débora, ¿no? Como, como el tema de la interseccionalidad del poder, que son dos temas fundamentales para el simposio Ubuntu, son críticos y super importantes en toda la discusión sobre justicia de género, integridad corporal y todo lo demás. Uh, yo tengo una larga trayectoria de trabajar con jóvenes y, y, y en particular con hombres jóvenes uh, y sobre todos esos temas. ¿no? Y a mí me parece súper relevante uh, y, y el, a lo largo de, de Latinoamérica hay una experiencia acumulada fuertísima ¿no? de diferentes instituciones, organizaciones sobre el trabajo directo con jóvenes, pero cómo ese trabajo eh, impacta o de alguna manera contribuye para cambios más estructurales. ¿no? Eh, y de ahí me parece que eh, una de las, uno de los retos que tenemos en ese momento actual de la historia, que es el avance de las fuerzas conservadoras eh, alrededor del mundo, no solamente de, en el caso de Latinoamérica, pero alrededor del mundo impacta dos sectores que a mí son fundamentales y es parte de mi experiencia personal de trabajo, ¿no? que es el sector salud y el sector educación. No me parece por casualidad que sean dos de los sectores más afectados por una agenda conservadora. ¿no? En el caso brasileño, por ejemplo, eh, los planes, el Plan Nacional de Educación y, el plan, y los planes locales de educación tuvieron que quitar el término género ¿no? de sus textos, eh, en el marco de lo que se llama alrededor de, de Latinoamérica de ideología de género, ¿no? entre comillas, con toda polisemia que eso significa para, para nosotros. Y por supuesto, eso también tiene un impacto fuerte en el campo de la salud. Entonces, para mí que trabajo con jóvenes hace tanto tiempo y, y acompañando otros compañeros y compañeras a lo largo de 20 años, por ejemplo, en favelas cariocas, en favelas de Río de Janeiro, veo cómo eh, estos impactos eh, son eh, diversos, pero de manera general más fuertes en las comunidades y las personas que más necesitan ¿no? de los aportes de una salud pública y de una educación pública, ¿no? Y, y cuando hablo, por ejemplo, de educación, no estoy hablando solamente de educación formal, ¿no? pero también de todos los aspectos relacionados a otras posibilidades de educación no formal. De la misma manera de pensar salud, no solamente con base en las, las instituciones de salud, pero también la salud comunitaria. ¿no? Entonces creo que ahí tenemos eh, un, un desafío grande por adelante, pero también 
por otro lado, eh, ver que hay una intensa movilización de jóvenes, en particular de jóvenes feministas. Eh, es decir, que eh, no solamente eh, la juventud como un grupo homogéneo, porque por supuesto no es un grupo homogéneo, pero pensar que, eh, sobre todo en tiempos conectados de Internet, eh, y creo que el año pandémico nos ha enseñado bastante también sobre, sobre la importancia de esta ese tipo de conexión, eh, cómo también esto se revela como un espacio de activismo y de activismo en pro de la igualdad de género, por supuesto, también se convierte en un espacio de disputas. ¿no? Entonces, creo que, que, que por ahí caminamos. Gracias. Obrigado. That's wonderful. So, um, you know, as Leila said, this is a vast topic. It definitely is a vast topic. And I've been scribbling away. I feel like I'm in class. I've learned so much. Um, I will summarize while um, Magali just takes a little bit of a look on my behalf. Uh, if there's anything in the in the chat box, uh, any questions, I'll summarize. And, everybody, you know, it's 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 incredible that Although all four of you do come from, you know, specialized domains, but, you know, separate from one another, you have brought up common threads, critical, critical common threads. Um, the issue of vulnerability and understanding the need, actually starting with understanding what does the young woman, the girl, the young woman, the woman need, the adolescent girl need. Understanding that two of you have spoke around that, Um, you know, Deborah initiated that, Vinuj went on and he expanded that by stating that as much as they had perhaps uh, prioritized safe abortion, but when they actually engaged with young women, their priorities around uh, SRHR was different. And, and so one critical ingredient to success will be to constantly keep the fingers on the pulse of the vulnerabilities Firstly, what are the vulnerabilities? Secondly, what are the needs? What do they need at that point in time? Um, and, and, and in that regard, being able to then leave no one behind. And, and Marcos and Leila raised this as well. Um, the issues of leaving no one behind, the, the wide demographies. Yeah, all four of you touched about the wild demographies. Women and girls are not homogenous, and then young ones are not homogenous either. Very interesting to hear uh, you raise, and this is a, an area that I, I was hoping someone would raise, and I'm glad it came up, and Marcos raised this around the digital divide and how th there is a positive that, that COVID-19 has brought to us. It has started to force us to close that digital divide. And what it is doing, it is bringing together greater cohesion across borders that you know we either our state actors have put or we ourselves have put and divided ourselves and yet somebody in peru somebody in togo somebody in new zealand in the pacific island will be having the same passion and intention around advancing srh and now COVID has brought us together so we do need to capitalize on this so that that is something to take forward. And then speaking of the word capital, again, this was raised by both Vinuj and Leila. Um, Vinuj used the term social capital, you know, and Leila in, in brought out the issue of agency, so building agency. So there is the social capital that we build amongst the young, the, the women, the girls, the adolescent girls, the women themselves, but also around them because they don't live in a vacuum. So this is where you bring in men and boys um, and, and of course leadership, because we do know that a huge proportion of leadership hold the purse strings that define power and they define assets and access um, beyond to healthcare services, but also education, livelihood, social protection, economic security, and all of these are vulnerabilities. And De Deborah, you know, raised this and they deepen the inequalities and the barriers. Something very critical uh, that Deborah raised is the climate crisis. So we've got COVID-19, but we've also got the climate crisis and it's a crisis and it's silence a bit loud. Once in a while it makes noise, once in a while it's silent, but it's creeping and we do need to keep that in mind as we move forward. So Magali, 
any anything in the in the uh, any question? We, uh, somebody has got. Oh, sorry, I was going to read. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you feel free to read yourself. You know, it's uh, just uh, one uh, question that came up. Uh, in addition to identifying needs and vulnerabilities, it's important to recognize the strength and the potential of those most affected by oppressive systems. Um, so I'll leave it at that as, as, as a comment. And because we don't have a lot of other questions or comments, Maybe you can, you know, use more of the time uh, with the panelists to comment and respond if you want to. R Rosia, can I? Thank you, my dear. Yes, uh, please. Uh, uh, you know, thank you to the for the chat participant for this issue, uh, pointing it out. Absolutely, uh, no argument there. But you know, even in looking at needs. One of the favorites that I've ever heard is they said, "If how do you determine needs? How do you really understand changing needs? Today, COVID happens. Life's changed for everybody, especially for young women in rural parts of the world, including India. What has really changed? How do you find out? So one of the favorite quotes is, like if Henry Ford had done a traditional market research or a qualitative study like what we do, he would have only found that men and women wanted faster horses. He would have never got into looking for cars as an idea from his assessment of needs. Similarly, one of our biggest challenges, I think, is how do we exactly gauge needs? Because very often when we judge needs, we superimpose our own understanding and perceptions of our needs. This, uh, your comment made me think of this as an additional comment, so I just wanted to offer that. So, Vinush, how do you gauge needs? Tell us. No, we, uh, I, I'm speaking here from... Effectively. Uh, because we are not very effective. Uh, we try and listen. We try and listen. <laughs> but we are listening with mm -hmm. our ears, mm -hmm. our mind. Uh, and where these two, how do we differentiate them, always seems to be a challenge that we are faced with. So I really don't have an answer, but I do think that even accepting this and therefore not accepting what our frameworks and our research tell us as gospel truths uh, is, I think, important. Uh, and we have gone through the whole spectrum. We have looked at you know, traditional research, quantity research, qualitative, in-depth research, focus group discussions, and now the latest fad, which all of us know is user-centric designs, uh, but they do, I'm really not sure that, uh, we have one standard reason, uh, I mean standard technique, but I think even just to starting out with saying the fallibility of research, fallibility of assessing need, I think is a good starting point to operate from and therefore be flexible to change. Hmm. Very interesting, flexible to change. Rosanna, uh, did, this, uh, this question is, sorry, um, if I may just did, reflect yes, Leila. On, this, on this remark in the chat box, I think this is absolutely right. And in, 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 in our advocacy, in our in our uh, strong desire to highlight um, how, inter how uh, systems of oppression intersect compounding forms of discrimination, those most left behind in our, uh, you know, um, strong, strong need to point out this whole notion of leaving no one behind. We have to be very, very careful, right? Not to fall too much into that victimhood narrative and see and highlight and give space and enable those voices to, to, to shine because on the ground there is tremendous um, work and examples of young people, of um, women and girls with disabilities, of indigenous youth coming up and being, that have been aging, right? At the end of the day, 
women and girls in communities have been, you know, holding up <laughs> the planet and 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 um, being such agents of change and, and 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 keepers of the social fabric in their community. So I think we really have to honor and recognize that. Um, there is tremendous contribution uh, happening and has been happening, right, since the beginning of time by, by women, girls, men, boys within their communities um, who, who may have been, you know, affected by um, power, privilege, oppression, but their voices have always been there. And it's just a matter of ensuring that when we talk about these issues, we are careful not to um, you know, uh, have it be a victimhood narrative. I think that's so, so important. I see that happening a lot in terms of gender equality and gender justice issues. So it's a, it's a very important reminder. And I just want to thank the, 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 the person for pointing that out. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It, it, uh, it's, uh, but, but that also takes us back to perhaps we're speaking as um, practitioners, um, some of you experts and so forth. And um, perhaps we ourselves require a refresher, <laughs> you know, and it's not just about the programs that we're putting out there, but we ourselves require a refresher. Um, very recently in, in, in one of the countries that Safed's, you know, overseas in the Sadek region, um, not gonna mention it, a, a very, very big global organization that does work around HIV and SRH issues, put out a campaign around the 16 days of activism campaign. And um, it was a competition to submit photos of how badly you were beaten. Yes. Okay. That really, that is it. Um, and, you know, I mean, there was such a horrific reaction by the gender activists. I'm, I, I can't say I'm a gender activist. I think I'm, 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 I just believe in the equality of humankind. But um, there was such a horrific reaction. And, and I sat down with my colleagues, um, you know, because this, this organization is a partner of ours and said, well, Maybe we've just made the assumption that when somebody comes in to be an implementer, a program officer, a manager, they, they have the passion and they believe in equality, but they perhaps haven't gone through the cap capacity, the skills building, you know, just some kind of training. So, so I think it's not just outward. When we speak about understanding power and, and, and bodily integrity and gender justice and so sexual reproductive health and the intersectionalities and what it means to, um, to empower and build resilience, it, we also have to do refreshers ourselves. I mean, if I've been doing something for 20 years, that doesn't mean I know it all because so much has evolved. So I'm just throwing that in there while I give Deborah <laughs> a bit of a, a space to come in. And perhaps because she was the first person who spoke about vulnerability. And, and I, I do know that she believes in, in balancing that with strengths, what her thoughts are around this. And I think I think that's a good segue into our next question. It's a matter of power. Because the more you, you indicate to a population that they're vulnerable, the less they're able to bring out their innate power. Um, and and it just becomes a, a cycle um, of no human and social development. So Deborah, what are your thoughts, please? Sí, sí, muchas gracias. Y, y yo quería responder tu pregunta retornando a la discusión libre con la pregunta que ha sido lanzada en el chat. Yo creo que son dos cosas diferentes acá. Una es que tenemos ciencia suficiente para conocer las necesidades de vida de las personas y de los cuerpos con género, de los cuerpos racializados, de los cuerpos que viven la pobreza. Tenemos ciencia suficiente. Y esta ciencia puede sí acomodarse a las emergencias que estamos delante de nosotras. Lo que estamos hablando acá de mensuración de vulnerabilidad no es una mensuración de la miserabilidad humana para, una, para un silenciamiento. Estamos hablando de mensuración para protección social. La, la, la vulnerabilidad es una manera de vivir la vida desprotegida. Así nombrar la vulnerabilidad no es el mismo que silenciar. 
Y no sé por qué necesitamos pensar, y esto es una manera muy cartesiana de pensar, que los caminos son uno o otro. Nombramos, operamos con la precarización de los sistemas de opresión que hacen las vidas más precarias. COVID nos mostró que nosotros vivimos en cuerpos precarios. Somos vulnerables como la condición humana. Pero el racismo, el sexismo, el patriarcado, las maneras de discriminación son formas deliberadas de precarización de la vida. Así cuando nombramos vulnerabilidad, nombramos dos camadas, una de operación de los cuerpos, pero otro que son la operación de las despropiaciones de la vida. Y esto no significa no reconocer nuestro rol de los cinco acá y de todos en posiciones de poder de cómo cambiar las metodologías políticas de trabajo con, para garantizar el acceso, para romper los ciclos de vulnerabilidad y de precarización de la vida, pero nombrar con las personas de que lo, lo que se hace y cuál es el resultado del poder. Así para mí hay un, un, una cosa por detrás para terminar, que es casi cuál es el rol de personas como yo, que en mi país, yo soy una, una latina, pero en mi país yo soy una mujer de privilegio, de mi color, de la manera con que hablo, de mi, ¿sí? de mi historia educacional. ¿Cuál es, ¿Cuál es mi rol al hablar de vulnerabilidad, de una vulnerabilidad que yo no lo vivo? Es hablar con, es escuchar, pero utilizar mi espacio de poder para sumarme al cambio, porque estamos hablando de acceso a las estructuras de poder. Y tenemos que hablar con el poder y para el poder. Gracias, obrigado. Mar you? Marcos, what are your thoughts about um, the measure of power against what has been shared now? Mm -hmm. Yo quería agregar un poco antes sobre la conversación también anterior, más libre sobre lo que mencionabas sobre el refreshment. ¿no? Eh, el hecho de estar como a 20 años yeah. en un campo específico no te hace inmune uh -huh. a, a, estos, eh, a estas cuestiones ¿no? de centrales eh, de poder. ¿no? Eh, yo tengo una posición, así como Debra, de bastante privilegio, ¿no? En, en mi país, ¿no? por, por ser hombre, primero, que la posición masculina todavía sigue siendo un valor eh, en una sociedad tan desigual como la nuestra, eh, pero también de mi posición ¿no? como profesor, como docente, como activista, de trabajo, investigador y no sé más qué. Eh, pero me parece que eh, en el campo ¿no? de trabajo con hombres, por la igualdad de género, por la justicia de género, es necesario un trabajo constante de evaluación, reevaluación eh, de nuestra posición como hombres. ¿no? Y, y me parece que muchas veces eh, hemos logrado discursos muy bonitos, muy... Eh, intensos eh, de manera pública, pero seguimos por otra vía replicando ¿no? el esquema del poder y de la desigualdad, sea con mujeres, sea con jóvenes, sea con ¿no? disputas con otras organizaciones y otras acciones de otros movimientos. ¿no? Eh, rescatando un poco lo que Débora eh, hablaba al inicio ¿no? eh, de, un, de una agenda ¿no? compartida ¿no? entre diferentes grupos, entre diferentes ¿no? activistas, militantes. Eh, yo creo que eso ha sido, por ejemplo, la tónica de, de mi vida profesional, con todos los desafíos que implica. ¿no? O sea, pensar ¿no? de ser un, un activista por la igualdad de género, pero también escuchar bastante a la gente que trabaja con derechos de la infancia. ¿no? Y cómo conectar las dos cosas y lo que es posible conectar. ¿no? Y ahí creo que el tema del poder no está solamente eh, en el macro, ¿no? Eh, no solamente en el micro, pero está también o sea, permeando todas las nuestras acciones. ¿no? Yo, sea, yo como profesor en una clase y formando profesionales de salud, 
é como esse tema me parece assim como fundamental, não? uma revisão crítica fundamental, sobretudo no campo da saúde, não? onde os profissionais também, de alguma maneira, podem exercer um poder eh, de maneira eh, muito complicada para, para a vida de mulheres e meninas. Em eh, no caso do Brasil, temos trabalhado um pouco mais com o tema, em meu caso personal, eh, com o tema da violência obstétrica. E a violência obstétrica é um bom exemplo, não? Eh, do manejo do poder sobre o parto, o nascimento e sobre a integridade corporal de outra pessoa, não? Eh, baseado em mis eh, creencias de buena práctica o de lo más fácil o lo que sea, ¿no? Entonces, así, creo que de cada, de cada quien de nosotros, o sea, un pensar en nuestras posiciones, como había dicho Débora y Leila, y pensar qué tipo de aporte siempre crítico necesitamos hacer. ¿no? Obrigado, thank you so much. And uh, it's true. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of, like you said, uh, we can roll off our tongues the right words and pen, you know, have uh, fantastic penmanship and produce glorious documents. But these issues are about the self, and it is about introspection. And we are not always the same person. What we were a year ago, what we were 10 years ago, what we will be in five years are different. And with that, our perception around power and how we wield our power might change. I, you know, I might be more compassionate this year and then in five years time, not be so compassionate. So it is really, really vital. And thank you for reminding us and also recognizing you know, the, the, the privilege um, as practitioners Uh, as those who, who who support to drive forward the agenda, it is so critical to not feel we know it all, but actually to recognize our privilege and to channel that to constantly advance uh, others. Um, so that's that was humanitarian, if I could put it that way. And I think this work is humanitarian. It's about feeling. It's not just about listening and getting the statistics. It's about feeling and, and moving others to feel the same. Uh, um, sense of justice, uh, care, respect. Great. So um, we don't have anything in the chat box, I think, but um, maybe Magali, do you have a specific question before I go to the next question? Do you have something specific you'd like our, our panelists to? I know you're burning. This is your favorite. <laughs> your favorite topic, so go for it. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, enjoying so much uh, the conversation that I don't have any specific uh, questions at this point. I think it's going, you know, in uh, giving us a very uh, good sense of uh, the challenges that we have, as, as, as you said, and especially with the, the experience we had this year with COVID and the desire, as Mark was saying, as activists to do things differently moving forward, you know, as we realize that what we thought was normal in terms of our health systems and our social protections were so off uh, that all it took was a virus to, to demonstrate that, that that was not a way to, to conduct uh, social life, uh, you know, and um, with the protection of the individuals and the, collect the collective you know, of us uh, as well, because um, across the, the globe, health is not a priority and uh, investments have been made in armaments and uh, in, uh, you know, a number of other um, areas, but not in the basic of keeping us, uh, you know, well, you know, the well-being of people, you know. Um, so that, I think it's a huge challenge. How do we prevent us from going back to, um, you know, to a, such a precarious uh, health system, social security systems, uh, legal and, and social protections uh, for people to have just basic well-being, you know, all over the world. 
So I, I want to continue listening. <laughs> Okay, thank you. But I think you've also asked a very, very important question. We, how do we make sure that we create a, a, a route with this new uh, pandemic to the extent that we're not going backwards? Because I think there's a lot of us who are waiting. And even in the language, we say, when things get back to normal, when things get back to normal, in my estimation, this is normal. This is right. So I'm going to go to Leila because um, she's also <laughs> she's also raised quite a lot of good practices. And I'd like us, you know, for the rest of the minutes, I think going forward, for us to share a little bit about what works, what has worked, and what should we take forward to work in um, ensuring that power wielded, um, power influenced is is recognizing bodily. Um, integrity and autonomy will ensure that there is gender justice in a sustained manner and of course ultimately that sexual reproductive health rights and universal health coverage is achieved. Um, what is it, you know, what is it that we've learned is good and we should be taking forward? Good practices. So Leila, I know you shared a few but I'm gonna push your boundaries a little bit more um uh, to share some more uh you know practical elements that either practitioners can do researchers mm -hmm. should be del delving into into more mm -hmm. policymakers mm -hmm. investors funders because our funders are also making a lot of decisions yeah. i come from the civil society you know um environment and uh, sometimes my hands are like this you know mm -hmm. so um go for it Thanks. I think it's really important at the end of the day to to be concrete, to be operational, and to um, at, you know think about what kind of change we can affect in communities on the ground where where uh, where I think it really matters. And as a as a as a you know institution that's an international organization and is decentralized and, and has many different um, staff and offices and efforts and partners. I think for us at the end of the day, what's critical is to is to is to keep our eye on what is working, what those good practices are, um, and how we can keep moving this agenda forward in a in a pragmatic manner. Um, and one thing that this year, since it was the Beijing Plus 25 year, uh, unfortunately a bit derailed because of COVID. Uh, but one thing that we have been saying very strongly is there is no gender equality without SRHR and no SRHR without gender equality. And that seems sort of an obvious statement, but uh, they're so in inextricably linked. Uh, so I think you cannot really see um, progress on reproductive rights on SRH without seeing the underlying gender inequality, the dynamics, the, 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 the gender relations. And that's been kind of our, our key mantra this year to really highlight how in order to get to, to the real crux of the issue, we have to address power, privilege, gender, et cetera. Um, one thing that I, I think we're talking about privilege, we're talking about power in our own positions. Well, for myself working in the, in the United Nations, institution i think one of the key things that you know we've been trying and, and myself have been really trying to advocate for is to use our position of power to support social movements um, and this is critical to really keep in mind as we talk about not just you know working with civil society as an implementing partner here or there to, to, to implement certain programs, but really supporting women's movements, you know, youth feminist organizations um, with, you know, enabling space for them to come together, um, you know, enabling them to come use our buildings, support them financially, and just really be there as a, as a, as a, um, a, a support, right? And, and so for, for us, I think we're really starting to see uh, the importance. I mean, of course, we have been, but but more and more so, um, the importance of supporting movements, and that that that's that's that works when you start to uh, 
um, uh, invest invest in a very real tangible way in in let's say you know youth led organizations or um, other organizations that are representatives of those who have been most left behind. And I think we're seeing promising signs of rising awareness and activism among social injustices, right? Especially among young people. And this is this is really encouraging. Um, whether it comes to gender, gender justice, climate justice, racial justice, we're seeing a real awakening of, of youth who uh, I mean, young people have always been behind revolutions, but um, you know, we're, we are seeing this awakening that that we we as the UN and as a as a community of um, forces promoting human rights. I mean, we have to get behind this and support it and enable those uh, people, those young people, to really um, you know uh, elevate their voices. But on a on a more practical note, one other thing that in the UNFPA, we're really trying hard in the next four years, because we're now developing our new strategic plan, which which um, uh, goes 2022 to 2026, uh, is, is the use of gender transformative approaches within our programs related to maternal health unmet need for family planning, addressing gender-based violence and harmful practices. Those three issues, by the way, happen to be what we call our transformative results, our, our, our key goals uh, for the next few years. And, and really starting to, we're, we're interrogating our own programs. Yes, we've been gender accommodating, we've been gender sensitive or responsive in our programs, but what does it really mean to be gender transformative through our work on you know, access to contraception, making sure that we have clinics to serve women who are giving birth in refugee camps. You know, what does that mean? So for us, one one key thing that I, I really um, think we will commit to is looking at gender transformative approaches. And we did a recent review and only 8% of the, of the reviewed evidence showed that gender transformative approaches were really being used when it comes to, for example, engaging men and boys in SRHR. So there's a Huge, there's a huge road ahead of us, right? Um, and I think the other thing that, more practically speaking, we are starting to realize is that for 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 many many years we've been talking about engaging men and boys, but um, you know I think what we're realizing is using that ecological model is going to be really key. So trying to affect change at the individual level, the interpersonal level, community level, systems level, right? So when it comes to services, we always talk about the AAAQ, which is the International Human Rights Standard for um, ensuring the best services that you can deliver. The AAAQ framework is um, available, accessible, acceptable, and of high quality services. So making sure that we're affecting change at the systems level when it comes to thinking about, you know, um, barriers that are related to gender as to why women and men are not accessing services. We also need to affect change at the policy and law level, which of course, you know, um, the norms behind are driving certain discriminatory laws and um, keeping policymakers from funding specific policies, right? I mean, there, there are deep rooted discriminatory gender norms behind all of that. And of course, at the socioeconomic level, so ensuring that we're promoting women's economic right, but also paying attention to what is happening in our media, what our young people are exposed to in our education systems. So, you know, in some, I think gender norms are complex, they're hard to change, they're stubborn, <laughs> but for us, I think as UNFPA, um, and, 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 I, and I think I can speak on behalf of many of our sister agencies, including UNICEF and UN Women and, and even UNDP, really going forward, um, you know, using gender transformative approaches and really interrogating what that means vis-a-vis uh, -vis our programs is going to be really absolutely key. Um, but I, I do want to I do want to thank the organizers. Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but I did want to say that <laughs> juxtaposing SRHR and the topic of power is excellent. And I just want to say thank you for that. So over. <laughs> thank you. Yes, definitely. It's been uh, I think it took COVID to get us back on track that power is the underlying um, 
cause of SRHR not being achieved and the SDGs. So thank you for reminding us because the reality is beyond just the intersect between SRHR and gender equality is um, if you look at at least 15 of the 17 SDGs, we interrogate the targets. If there is no gender equality, those targets, even, even if they get met, are not going to be sustained because when one human being is left out for whatever reason, um, then and, and there's the issue of soji. We've we've not said much about that. So it's not just <clears throat> excuse me about men and women, but it's also the diversity within that. The you know the, those of varied sexual orientation and sexual uh, and gender identity. Um, it becomes even more complex. And I guess I guess we are speaking about them when we're talking about being left behind. But it's so important to be bold about it. And um, very similar to women and girls, very similar to adolescents and young people. And I do want to point out children as well, older children, when given the agency, when given the tools, when given the confidence, um, they just the same, those who are displaced persons, um, LGBTQ plus I populations, those living, uh, those with disabilities, they really come alive and their power Powers that we could not imagine until you give them the space to reveal their power and give them the confidence and the voice um, to be on platforms like this. And, 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 and Magali, maybe this series needs to continue in 2021. And we, you know, we, we bring those voices on board to actually speak and give us their story and their testimony of how, what pathway did they go down to be able to exert their power and be part of their own agenda make a difference, speak out to policymakers, uh, protect and preserve their communities, and also move from being perpetrators to, to actually being preservers and pro protagonists, you know, of, um, of justice. And this could be, you know, gender or racial. So, um, Deborah, what are your thoughts around practical actions that we should be taking going forward to address the power um, challenges that are facing us and are going to increase. Um, we know they're going to increase going forward. There's a lot of opposition around SRHR, as many of you are aware, um, funded by fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists and, and powers that may be. Um, what would be your practical suggestion going forward? Um, in that regard, Deborah. Yo voy a seguir mucho lo que Leila habló, que para mí es como un fundamento de toda la posibilidad de, de la respuesta acá, pero yo quería ser muy pragmática, o sea, con tres puntos, ¿sí? Como una, una tentativa de, de, de clarificar tu pregunta. La primera es que tenemos que crecer permanentemente en el poder de la sociedad civil, en, en el poder de las organizaciones que son lideradas por gente concreta. Cuando hablo de gente concreta es que no son las agencias, las estructuras globales y que son cada vez más organizaciones que, que no están siquiera registradas, que se conforman de acuerdo con, con el contagio de, de, de una posibilidad. Pero esto se cambia la conciencia política, las conexiones entre grupos muy diversos. Y cuando vamos a tener situaciones dramáticas como la que están pasando países como Brasil, Venezuela en este momento, es la sociedad civil que está ahí para hacer la permanencia de las demandas y la protección de las necesidades de las poblaciones más vulnerables. Y esto demanda paciencia. Y este es algo que las organizaciones internacionales, los donantes, los gobiernos con, la, con toda la ayuda internacional comprenden mal con los indicadores de suceso, porque un proceso de incidencia política es de una década, dos décadas. Y esto está pasando ahora en Argentina con el cambio de la ley de aborto. Son estos días, los días de la vigilia de la ola verde, de las mujeres en la calle. Y esto toma dos décadas. Y las mujeres, ah, hablamos en, en, en el español de, de Argentina, las pibas, como las niñas, estas niñas grandes que acabaste de mencionar, que están en la calle, 
y que están con, con las bandanas verdes a decir el aborto va a ser legal. Bueno, es investir una inversión en la sociedad civil. El segundo es que está conectado, tenemos que trabajar con la juventud, pero una juventud diversa. Y acá si hay un poco de esperanza en este mundo que no puede ser el nuevo normal, José, como hablaste, no puede ser. Tenemos que aceptar que algo está muy mal y comprender esto, pero si hay algo que va a ser un, un resultado de este proceso son estos encuentros virtuales, donde hay maneras de hablar, donde hay los captions, subtitles, donde hay maneras de conectar gente que no estaba antes. Y esto es muy poderoso y transformador para la juventud, para una juventud con discapacidad, que no tenía movilidad para estar en los espacios globales de habla y de participación. Para el sur global, que el idioma era una barrera. Y yo creo que nos, nosotros tenemos que pensar con creatividad que estas son plataformas de poder para construcción de asambleas, asambleas políticas de conexión para la transformación. Y de ahí, yo, yo termino, tenemos que al romper los silos ¿sí? del feminismo, de los ambientalistas, de los antirracistas, la construcción de vocabularios que nos suenan un poco extraños. Para el feminismo en ese momento, tenemos que hablar, hablar del trabajo del cuidado, de la economía del cuidado de cómo la protección social tiene que estar al centro de cualquier respuesta, respuesta a una emergencia de salud pública. Y nosotras como feministas, si me nombro de esta manera, tenemos dificultades de hablar, de hablar que la salud sexual y reproductiva está conectada a la desigualdad de clase, que está conectada a la desigualdad racial, y que esto está conectado a las protecciones sociales del Estado. Así que este este cambio de vocabulario, de palabras que pueden sonar com, como viejas, ¿sí? son palabras transformadoras. Así que son los tres puntos o sea, que, que yo terminaría este momento. Obrigada. Gracias. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Yeah, you have a mellow way. I, I, I was so engrossed, I didn't really write down what you said. <laughs> um, you've got a very mellow way of, of, of sharing um, and, and, and bringing that holistic. I think, I think what you've done is you've really pulled it all together. A lot of what um, you know, colleagues have been sharing, there, there does have to be that, that holistic eye. Um, and it, you know, I'm hearing constantly that it goes down back to the community. So civil society represents the community. It's the people. It's always been the people. The, the most progressive revolutions have been by the people. Um, the greatest technological breakthroughs have been by the people. And um, it's, it's, yeah. So we will wrap up a little bit on, on your uh, later on, a little bit more on what you said, Deborah, later on. But I'd like to move on to Minu. She's been very quiet. And um, so, Vinush, what are your thoughts around what has been shared? And, um, you know, what are some of your practical suggestions going forward um, in addressing these, you know, these intersectional matters towards a sustained SRHR frame for the world? And you know you're you're very much on the ground yourself, from my understanding. <laughs> you're very you you're extremely on the ground in terms of the work that you do. So it'd be great to hear some some practical examples of what you um, are proposing as a way forward, because you know it works and it will work as well um, amidst COVID and post COVID. So the first part of the question is very easy, Rosa. You asked me what is my reaction to what was said by the experts here. Total agreement and some new thoughts. So thank you. The, coming to the second part, uh, I the, the one thing that I find is, uh, you know, when we're talking of power itself, uh, and uh, I totally agree uh, that um, there is a huge difference because I think Marcos mentioned it men having power. 
and i've seen it work both ways often men do not recognize the power they have and so cannot be supportive and sometimes men are very aware of the power they have and end up abusing it uh, so like for example we the it's very interesting uh, but we have not been able to decipher really the motivation but right across experiences research like we do spousal especially in a context like india you know if some women and girls have to access health uh, srhs they do need support of men uh, because even accessing going to the nearest pharmacy nearest uh, provider needs economical support permission social support etc so you need to navigate this through their uh, partners interestingly we get to see both uh, research also backs it up our uh, like practical experience there's not much relative uh, spousal communication or agreement when it comes to family planning issues contraception but when it comes to abortion there is an in contrary to our beliefs uh, that's why i keep saying learn 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 and we don't know much uh, contrary to our beliefs uh, we realize there's quite a significant level of spousal communication and we've not been really able to decipher why but if we could bring what happened so what is happening we understand when we talk about that is also because uh, family planning in their minds is a long term continual issue that they are facing so there's no sense of emergency while abortion Uh, you know the decide to the decision and the action to manage an unwanted pregnancy eh, has a more immediate immediacy to it so probably one of the things we could do if we need to get men at the levels of their households to be more supportive and to break the power eh, we may have to bring a sense of immediacy urgency and a perception of that but that's my theory i feel please don't follow it up with a, a question how do we do that uh, uh, pro- uh, probably as uh, you may need to do again a series of things over a period of time to do this but that's one issue of power the other big thing that we see especially when it comes to young girls seeking any srhr but primarily you know the court uncourt socially conditioned srhr like contraception abortion it's not just men even women in power providers hu- tend to be huge barriers probably equal barriers being judgmental and especially uh, uh, in india at least we have realized the women because of the role that they play as the the role they perceive and take over as being gender guardians eh, make them even more judgmental about eh, the younger girls coming in for services so one of the things that we have done and which has been going on uh, for long is values clarification you know unearthing these values and clarifying them but finally i think uh, you mentioned it's all at the individual level but the, what is the best way to break power we i think debra talked about uh, argentina the legality of abortions etc uh, in india despite abortion being legal for the last 50 plus years only about 14 per, uh, 22% of abortions happen in a facility like mexico what did women do they took over the power of the right of abortion by self managing abortion so when you see these trends happening what can we do at the policy level at implementation level at the level like what we do of training and empowerment what is it find out what is it that women need to take the self care through they may need information so how do we provide them information maybe now digital solutions are there uh, the youtube uh rural indian women 
uh, search for abortion using voice search in Google. They are illiterate women. They mm. cannot type in, but they do voice search. Uh, so what are those nuanced places? And another of our research findings has been very clear. These women tell us, we don't want information, you to come in and give us information. So, you know, the, uh, but we want a source where we can trust information. So it knocks away some of our traditional information sources, like our uh, information posters and pamphlets and stuff like that, and allow information to reside somewhere, like in a helpline, you know, hotline, or like in a digital uh, YouTube channel, so on and so forth, that will help them complete their because they have anyway, they found a way to break the power barriers that are existing in their house, in the community, and at the facility for accessing SRH services. They've already found the mechanism. Now, how is it that we chip in and support? That's what I think. That's fantastic. That is really fantastic. When you know, when you got to the point of the um, the less literate women using voice search to find their own information, I kind of sat back and I thought, "Wow, you know, that is." I think this is what you know, Leila and others have, have spoken about. That is the agency. They've 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 become aware. They're given the tool. Perhaps you know, um, they might not have access to a, a gadget, a cell phone, but they're provided that and. Um, and they transcend the fact that they don't have the high literacy level. It doesn't stop them from exercising their rights to information um, using audiovisual, obviously, because they're not reading. That's um, incredible. And it really, really enforces, reinforces practically the you know, agency in practice. Um, yes, you know me too well. I was going to ask you how. Uh, but you actually, I think, answered the how. Um, and... Um, and uh, Leila also answered it. Uh, the GNT, the, the gender norms transformation, um, and similar to what Deborah mentioned um, as well, and what Marcos, we know Marcos's was really about that introspection. And these are all methodologies to, together with the values clarification. Those are processes and, and in itself would require little skills building and workshop and, <laughs> and so forth, but they work. They definitely work. Um, you know, in South Africa, and I'll give examples from the global South in Africa, because that's just really what I know all my life. Um, South Africa is the one, you know, one of the very, very few countries on the African continent where access to safe abortion is constitutionally, you know, it's legal without restriction. But there is a conscientious objectivity, objection in there, right? And, and sadly, heart, heartache. Um, you know, the, the, the studies have shown that um, women and girls are continuing to access unsafe abortion. The percentage of unsafe abortion is very high. Why? Because when they do present, um, it is often an older woman, maybe not even so much of an older woman, but it is often a woman who presents their individual judgment um, on the issue of abortion. And that word spreads in the community and then they don't go and they don't access services. So yes, I think I think when power is used wrongly, it's not just about men. It's any human being who uses power in a harmful way um, that can violate bodily integrity. And that, um, but I'm not going to delve into that lest I get into trouble. Um, Marcos, <laughs> Marcos, what are your thoughts? about all of this fantastic and richness, but what are your thoughts on, on practical, um, in addition to what you already mentioned, you know, practical actions that we need to carry forward? Um, bien, primero quería agradecer muchísimo a las contribuciones de cada quien en el panel porque ha sido súper, súper interesante y me hace pensar también un montón de cosas, ¿no? sobre mi propia práctica y también la red social, ¿no? que estoy parte ahora en Brasil y, y también con compañeros y compañeras de América Latina, ¿no? para pensar así, un montón de cosas. Eh, me parece, así, desde mi punto de vista, de, de trabajar con, con formación y formación profesional, ¿no? de trabajar bastante con educadores, educadoras, con profesionales de salud, 
e sempre ha sido um, um tema que era como nunca havia pensado isso em minha formação inicial, não? Seja eu sou médico, ou enfermeiro, ou enfermeira, ou trabalhadora social, nunca havia tenido contato com o tema de gênero, sexualidade, poder, interseccionalidade, privilégios, e como isto é fundamental para uma boa prática, seja em la escola, seja em los serviços de saúde. No, eh, hay más que investigaciones y estudios comprobando eh, el impacto positivo ¿no? de, eh, de ese proceso de educación para profesionales que a mí me parece sumamente importante eh, para la vida de toda la gente. ¿no? Y les doy dos, dos ejemplos que me parecen súper interesantes. El primero que yo trabajo en Fiocruz, que es un instituto de salud pública, y más precisamente un hospital ¿no? de salud de la mujer. Eh, y por la primera vez llegó un hombre trans embarazado para tener su bebé. Y eso produjo una revolución en el buen sentido ¿no? de discutir varias cosas. ¿no? Lo que significaba tener dos hombres, un hombre trans y un hombre cis, que estaban en el momento más rico de sus vidas, que era tener su primer hijo, hija, ¿no? su primer bebé. Pero eso produjo un impacto súper interesante en, en el equipo de salud, ¿no? para discutir lo que hemos discutido, ¿no? el respeto al cuerpo de este hombre, porque era un hombre, pero un hombre embarazado y un hombre que iba a tener su bebé. Eh, y pensar fuera de las cajas, que es un desafío. Es un desafío para todos y todas. ¿no? pero sobre todo para profesionales de salud que son tienen una formación muy, muy biomédica muchas veces eh, muy prescriptiva fue una oportunidad de pensar fuera de la caja y creo que pensar fuera de la caja es algo extremadamente importante y, y un desafío constante en nuestras vidas ¿no? Y, y el segundo ejemplo es de una, de una profesora de una escuela. Es decir, cómo tornar las escuelas más inclusivas a la diversidad. Y cuando hablo de diversidad, o sea, en el sentido más amplio, ¿no? De la diversidad de género, de la diversidad sexual, de la diversidad de colores, de piel, de la diversidad religiosa. ¿Cómo pensar en estos aspectos en mi práctica cotidiana? Entonces, eh, en términos de transformación de género y transformación sí. social, diría yo, de manera más amplia, eh, tener, tomar en cuenta que trabajar con estos profesionales eh, es parte de un eje fundamental. ¿no? Eso por un lado. Y por otro lado, creo también que eh, rescatando un poco lo que Débora había mencionado en su primera intervención, eh, el compromiso ético que tenemos todos y todas con esa transformación. ¿no? Eh, y para nosotros que trabajamos con ciencia, ¿no? eh, Débora, mi compañera de universidades y, y todo, ver el negacionismo de la ciencia y el ataque de la ciencia por parte de fuerzas conservadoras es muy duro. ¿No? Y creo que eso también hace parte de una agenda política más amplia de transformación de género, transformación social. ¿no? ¿Cómo pensar en estos ámbitos también? Sé que estoy hablando de una manera más amplia y quizás más macro, pero ese macro tiene una importancia vital, fundamental, en las prácticas cotidianas de todos y todas. ¿no? Entonces, era un poco por ese camino que quería agregar. Thank you, dear Marcos. That's um, and and it was important. I mean, you're you're. <laughs> it's it's almost like Magali selected all four of you to be in perfect complement because you do bring all the different pieces into this one machinery. Um, you you really strongly brought in the the, the diversity issue and the reality on the ground. Um, you know, it, it, and a health worker stands there, instead of worrying about the heartbeat of the baby, it's like, well, you're a man, why are you having a baby? It's ridiculous. I'm an ex-health worker, so I understand. <laughs> um, uh, but we have 
we have a couple of minutes to go and I will give you all four of you a little bit of time to come up with your last punch and motivational and exciting and pragmatic message that you would like to leave us, but really also leave the world because this is a global symposium and many people are going to be watching this. I believe Magali, am I right? This is being recorded and it will be watched and hopefully be watched over and over again. So as you do that, I am going to do um, a summary of uh, what I think in my humble listening, um, I have gleaned um, out, of, out of today's very rich two hours. So there, you know, there, there are 12 things that stood out. Um, and so I'll go through those quickly and then we will do a round from all four of you to give us your one minute and then I'll hand over to, to Magali. Um, I think that the, the first thing is, is a recognition that the issue of power, the matter of power, the matter of bodily integrity has not been unpacked adequately when we speak both gender justice and sexual reproductive health rights. And there's more that needs to be done for us to understand that, not only as implementers, as funders, but also our target audiences that we work with, whether it's leaders, um, communities, um, and, and, and so forth. The issue of harmful practice and appreciating that in the majority of our societies, harmful practice begins so early on um, in the life of a girl. It's almost like part and parcel of the life of the girl and, and breaking that. The third one is understanding what violence really means and violation. There is still, you know, after all these years, after CEDO, after ICPD, there is still so many um, contradiction around marital rape. You know, there is no acceptance of marital rape. There is still systemic violence that is, you know, ex almost condoned and acceptable as being part of perhaps military law enforcement, that it's part of that, and yet it's not. So the definition of violence. The third one is a reminder that bodily integrity, and I'm, I'm throwing that in, is a human rights. And this was something when Magali approached me, I had to Google and read up on, and I, I, I didn't realize that it is actually a human right. It makes a big difference when you say that over and over again. The fourth one is a reminder of all the commitments. So as much as we move forward, we have to constantly bring to account our duty bearers. We have to bring um, enough empowerment and capability to our citizens to bring to account duty bearers who have committed in, in fancy spaces in Geneva and New York and wherever to ICPD, to CEDO, to Beijing, to all the you know, the regional commitments, you know, whether it's in South America, whether it's in uh, Asia, in, in the SADC region, this is very critical. And we have to empower our citizens to know these because it's, it's what their states give them. Stigma and discrimination, you raised that a lot. And I want to bring that to, your, to the fore, that the stigma, discrimination, oppression, exclusion um, is, is very interwoven when we speak about power and uh, power and bodily integrity. Then the sixth one was the intersect, um, that these three issues are closely intersecting with issues of climate crisis, social protection, health, education, and that these sectors need to start speaking around gender equality. They need to start speaking around SRHR as a norm woven into their, their sectors, whether it's for ministry level and so forth. The issue of vulnerability was raised and that how it's continually important for us to understand vulnerability, to understand what the needs of women and girls are and the non-homogeneity thereof. Um, but more importantly, as we understand vulnerability, we also must definitely understand the strengths that lie in the populations that we want to support. Several of you kept using that term, support, facilitate, support, facilitate. The fifth, the seventh one is um, linked to this is recognizing privilege. Those of us like ourselves, you know, who kind of have the privilege, do we introspect enough? Do we retrain ourselves enough and do for the others um, and channel that, that, uh, that privilege 
in a positive manner. And there were two, there was a word that was used and the word was patience. Um, and you know, Deborah used this word about being patient. So as we're investing, um, we also have to be patient and keep and persevering. I want to add, if you allow me, to be bold as well. And COVID-19 has really, if anything to me, it has, yeah, I might look confident, but that's probably because there was COVID-19. It, you know, it has brought out a boldness because it's enough is enough to humanity. And we have to capture that boldness. The ninth has been the closing the digital divide and how powerful closing the digital divide is for that shared agenda. We need to take that forward. And the 10th is related to the social capital, and you've all spoken around that. Building resilience, building agency, it's not just about the women and girls, but also the young people, um, the, the, the labels, marginalized and left behind, um, men and boys, it's worked. Let's continue identifying new ways, and we've heard new ways, um, and so forth. The 11th one was, um, you know, is something about, you know, having a united front and staying united. And this I'm bringing in myself in that there has been a lot of competition around within the SRH framework of response, within the HIV framework response, within gender equality. COVID has taught us we need to stop this competition. We need to be coming together. We need to put our monies together. We need to support and build each other's agendas. And that is going to make the difference. And I think the final one I want to remind us is there is a huge opposition rising on SRHR. Even though the global gag rule is likely to be lifted by the Biden-Harris administration, um, this is probably going to take a while, but there is a lot of opposition in some of our sectors and we do have to stay vigilant. So thank you so much for um, giving time to my voice and I guess my face to a degree. I will now go around and ask Deborah for your last golden nugget. And from Deborah, we will go to um, Marcos. From Marcus, we'll go to Leila, and then we will wrap up with our um, Vinush from the beautiful India. Uh, muchas gracias, José. Su resumen de hoy es como un, un momento para tomar notas y pasar diciembre analizando esto, ¿no? Porque acá hay un resumen de que ¿Y qué, ¿Qué tenemos que empezar 2021? Y yo quería adicionar un, un sentimiento, sí, sí puedo. Yo tengo mucha esperanza. Esto no es el mismo que optimismo. El optimismo es un, un afecto, un sentimiento de los débiles. La esperanza es un principio ético de quien está siendo movida por la transformación. Estamos hablando de otra manera. Estamos nos conectando a otras personas. Estamos reconociendo las marcas de la colonización, de la opresión, incluso en nosotros, las personas de buena voluntad, ¿no? Yo tengo esperanza. Muchas gracias. Ahora me toca a mí, por lo que entiendo. Sí. Sí. Eh, también así, agradecer muchísimo la oportunidad de estar con, con todos y todas y, y quería agregar dos cosas ¿no? y yo creo que eh, el tema del simposio ¿no? tener ahí como el nombre Ubuntu ¿no? yo soy porque nosotros somos creo que es eh, el significado más fuerte ¿no? de de lo que Débora menciona como esperanza, ¿no? Que no, hay, que no hay de mi perspectiva un regreso a lo normal o un nuevo normal. Si hay un nuevo normal, que sea el nuevo normal de la transformación constante, de los cambios constantes, hacia una, una utopía que nos mueve de alguna manera, ¿no? Que es la igualdad y la justicia, ¿no? Y, y quería terminar con un, 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 parte de una canción de Caetano Veloso, un artista brasileño, 
não? que se chama Divino Maravilhoso, e, e que é, é necessário estar atento e forte. Então, esse é o meu mensagem final. E de início também. Leila? My turn, yes. <laughs> so it's funny because uh, as Deborah was speaking, I looked down at my notes that I had scribbled down and I also had hope. Um, so, uh, you know, last year in November, we hosted the Nairobi summit to commemorate the ICPD's 25th anniversary. And at the end of the symposium, uh, there were over 1,250 commitments by all, all kinds of actors, civil society, government, uh, private sector, about how they would commit to the unfinished agenda of the ICPD program of action. And so for me, I think that one year on, um, you know, that hope is, is still very much alive and that energy is still there. And I really, really want to just say that going forward in the feminist spaces in particular, um, we have to be open to talking about gender norms affecting everyone uh, women, girls, men, boys, gender non-conforming persons, uh, in, in, in an honest way that harmful gender norms really affect everyone. And, and that I think will really help us evolve towards realizing gender justice as a whole. Um, and finally, I think we have to, we have to listen. Um, I think the interesting thing about power is, um, the higher one goes in a position of power, it seems like the less capacity they have to listen. <laughs> so um, I think this is really something that we have as part of our growth that we talked about and, and, you know, interrogating ourselves and refreshing ourselves that we talked about is this ability to listen, um, to give space, uh, know when to step aside and, yeah. and, just, and just be quiet <laughs> and let, let those um, need to take that space to talk to talk. And finally, to be bold and brave in the way we talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, I think Binoj talked about, um, in a way, how as, as, a, as a movement, perhaps, you know, we, we find ways to deal with the contention by depoliticizing and, and, and making it a health issue and, and, and talking about, um, you know, really promoting rights as a, as a health issue, which is critical. But I think to be really brave and to be really bold, I think we have to be unafraid uh, to, to, to politicize it and, 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 and talk about the subjugation of women's sexuality and re fertility as, a, as an issue of power. Um, so, yeah, but thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. And I, I have really learned so much from all of the co-panelists and our moderator, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And if I have, if the one thing that I would like to share with you, all of you is, and I think Marcos, you kind of, it's something similar to what you said. Uh, you know, when we are looking at COVID, all of the, the message for all of us who are working in the space of social reconstruction uh, or social betterment, what we, you know, we all knew that we need to disrupt existing systems uh, and we have not been doing a good job of it. COVID came and did a great job of it. Now, let us take an advantage of that and rebuild a society, a community, an organization that we really wanted. So COVID, I think, has done us a favor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I think from the continent of Africa, the continent of Asia and the Americas, I think we've covered it all. And I'm sure our delegates are from, from other continents. I will hand back to uh, Magali. I do hope that we all meet each other soon someday or collaborate with each other in one form or, or another. Thank you, Magali. Over to Thank you. you. Thank you, Rosé. You know, amazing moderation, as I, you know, expected. And thank you all, uh, the panelists.